what kind of uh, situation it was when he when when he left and you took over? Not good. <laughs> <laughs> no, the situation was either we go bankrupt and start from the from the very bottom, you know, from the third league without a name and nobody gets any money. The arena is managed by someone else, and you know, so that was one option. And the other option was to try to get the money, try to somehow survive and then and get everything back on track and uh, thankfully that's that's what happened how did you survive the million dollar question how did you manage to pull that all off a lot of work that's it <laughs> no it's it's this you know the people around uh, that trusted the idea they helped and you know all we had to do is push and then try little by little to you know to overcome the obstacles that we had when you there's, there's no one thing I can say, you know. That yeah. We did not win the lottery, obviously. We, we had to do the work. When you started, you it seems that you have to have have to have a a vision at the beginning. Did you have a vision, and how did you reach to this vision? How did you know what kind of club do you have to build? I don't know why we played in Euroleague all the time. You watch NBA, you watch Euroleague, you know where you want to be. You want to be competitive, and again. You know that the, the most important thing is to know who you are and who you will never be. So we will never be a 25 million or 40 million budget club. And we don't want to be that kind of club. We know we can be smaller, you know, with the Pianian passion, with, you know, our fighting spirit. And, and that's the way to go. So as soon as we decided that this is the way we're going to go, that's, that's when the building of, of everything starts. How big of a uh, part of this club is developing your own players and, for example, selling either selling them out or to be it successful with them? Well, it's not about the selling. It's it's more about having the local players, you know, play on the on the team. This is this is the most important goal. Uh, selling it's more, I think, for the foreigners that if we can bring foreign players who are close to the NBA or, or possible NBA prospects, you know, it's easier because. With them, you already know. The Lithuanian players, you start from 12 years to look at them and you don't know who will go up, who will go down, who will be better. So, the number one priority is to have local players on our team and only then, you know, look at the opportunities to maybe make some profit if they go to the NBA or whatever. But it's one in 10 years, I guess, that, that it can happen. In Estonia, we have all the, all the time this uh, tiny problem, so to speak, uh, which is uh, more important, either winning or either playing with uh, local players. What's your your philosophy here? If you're losing, nobody will come to watch the game. I I had this all the time in my head, and you know when the crisis came, if you bring all the Lithuanians, nobody will come and say, okay, you played good, you're Lithuanian or you're Estonian in Estonia, and we support you, and that's it. Uh, everybody supports only the winners. If you if you keep losing, then it it's you know you don't reach the most important uh, phase of the of the game so i mean not only Euroleague but even locally mm -hmm. so you cannot get the best i'm talk, taking our example you cannot take the best guys from lithuania because you know few of them play in the nba some play in china some play in other Euroleague teams so if we take only what's left uh, not the highest quality we cannot compete in the in, in the Euroleague. So it has to be the balance, and uh, if you listen to the people that are saying that be all Estonian and we will support you, trust me, it's you know you cannot believe on that because as soon as the team loses ten games or, or something like that, everybody will forget that it's all Estonians and and, and you know we'll wait for results somewhere in the, in the future. Everybody wants a result now, and you know if you don't get the result, the, the coach has to go, the management has to go, and, and so on and so forth. In the junior competition, it's a bit different. We focus more on the player development. You know, it's never a goal to have, you know, to win the second league or to be fourth or to be somewhere. In, in the junior system, it's completely different. It's focused on creating players, growing them, and, you know, again, trying to grow as many as we can for the new league. Mm -hmm. you, you also mentioned about uh, managing uh, Jalgeris Arena. Uh, that has been uh, integral integral part of uh, Connor Jalgeris now. Yes. Does it uh, 
benefits you uh, your budget a lot or is it more like uh, just a great opportunity to save money no it, it helps with the budget and if not for the arena Jalgiris would have never survived because uh, you know again arena is arena management is a business and unfortunately this business is mostly run by some other companies who make profit and, and take the profit as you know as any business to themselves the, the biggest benefit that we have is that the profit that we get we always use and it stays in the sports or we try to develop the arena and do something for fans to enjoy it much more and uh, again this is not saving money this is having a business having a business of oriented mentality and of course financially helping the club and, and uh, not only basketball but also football rugby and all the mm -hmm. other skills so how do you feel yourself are you more of like uh, a leader of a sports club or are you more like businessman who runs the company uh, businessman who runs sports club <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes this is the goal i mean this this has to be the goal which is different and difficult in europe but look at all the nba clubs they are all businesses and they all run mm -hmm. with the mentality of making money and not some owner that gives the money and then you know you, you never get it back and uh, this is what we are talking to the EuroLeague now and, and trying to explain that this is the path where we have to go and uh, more clubs own the arenas they m would make more money and they closer to business because I think again this is the first step if you own the arena if you run the arena you have a home for the team and mm -hmm. if you have a home for the team then it's, it's different Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you ask me to say where my heart is, my heart is with the basketball, of course. Um, uh, that's where I started and that's where my passion is. But, but managing the arena and having business side, it really helps you a lot to know how, how to put numbers together and, and, and how to make, to look at the basketball, not like, you know, I take something and I spend it, but to spending uh, how much, where, and how to improve and what to improve in order to uh, at least not lose money, but the, the, the ideal is to make money. Does it happen so often that uh, these two sides will go to conflict, business side and basketball side? Uh, a little bit, a little bit, but again, uh, in our case, uh, we know it's built for, for basketball. And uh, <coughs> again, when we run it, we know that it is the, the main priority is basketball. Mm -hmm. So we lose some business decisions because the priority is basketball. Mm -hmm. But you know this and you don't go into the conflict and say, okay, you have to move and play somewhere else because we want to have this concept. Everything is said from the very beginning that first we put yearly games, then no matter how big the stars are coming, only then is the concept. If some young dudes in Estonia are watching you, and if they could ask uh, about your opinion or suggestions how to build up a uh, professional and uh, successful club what advice would you give to uh, so to speak young managers what to of what to think of building up a basketball club and successful basketball basketball club business wise too don't do it i would say first <laughs> No, you have to you have to love it and you have to know that this takes a lot of you know for me it's easy it's my passion i live with basketball all my life and i i love it and uh, it's not it's not work it's not like you wake up and i have to go to work you, you you love it but on the other side you know you don't have weekends you don't have you know regular job from eight to five or nine to six it's it's completely different and the speed is I worked in different companies and businesses, so the speed in sports club is three times faster than anywhere else. So one week is like three weeks somewhere else. But the advice is, you know, just go and do it, and, and don't forget to learn. And it's it's easy to open many doors if you go and you know uh, ask for advice as to you know what can be done and so on and so forth. But it's it's hard. But you know, if you if you love it, if you like it, if you have a vision what you want to do. It takes only time and, and energy. That's it. Anything can be done. How do you maintain your shape uh, mentally, wise and uh, physically? I see that you work standing. Uh, yes, but <laughs> it, again, it's, it has to be a balance. Mm -hmm. 
there are hard times and there are good times. Last year we had a lot of fun. This year it's harder, but again, you you know you know where to put the focus on. And there are things you can control and things you cannot control. And it's those things that you cannot control like to take your part. But you know, now with eleven years experience it's easier to say, okay, this is I cannot control and I can focus on what I can do and if I do one hundred percent that I promised and that I can do, no matter what happens I will, you know, not pay attention to what's going on, which is how much you uh, participate in uh, selecting players, select, like uh, recruiting different players? Is it all to manager or is it your job? Uh, it's again, if you talk about youth, it's completely on Robert just now mm -hmm. because he took over and he's learning a lot and, and, and fast with the with the first team. Again, it depends on the coach. Mm -hmm. With some coaches, it was ninety nine percent of my decision and talking to them. With, with Sharas, it's, I would say, 50-50, the coaches and the management, uh, which direction we go, but all the negotiations and everything, I still do it because, you know, I know the agents, I know the players, and it's, it's, it's interesting. It's one thing, building a team is the most interesting part uh, in, in the job. How, do you, how would you eval evaluate uh, this year now? It seems the playoffs are very tight to mildly speak, uh, how do you evaluate the sporting side of this season? It's not a good season. It's, 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 for you it's no playoffs, no good. It's not only the players, we lost We lost the cup, which you know was one of the goals, mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't do that. Uh, EuroLeague again, it's not only about the players, but about the wins, and uh, we lost many games that were close, and again, this is the, this is the mentality, I guess. Have the mentality that you can win tough games, you feel much better. Mm -hmm. No matter if you don't make the playoffs, because with our budget and with everything, we understand that we will not be there, you know, all the time. But, but yes, with all the injuries, with all the things that are happening around the team, and especially now when you don't win the games, it's like I say, the not like fun, fun, but you don't get what you come to do, and when you don't get the result that you wanted to do, there's no comfort inside. So in that sense, it's it's a bad year for us because we didn't get the good feeling that we did a great job. It was many times this close, but still it, it, it's mentally it's really tough to swallow it. You are all very, very competitive guys here. I think, I guess everyone, every last one of here is very competitive. Are you already working towards uh, next season? Are you focusing on that already? <laughs> You have everything already in place. Not, ideas not, and stuff. not in place. We know again. It's always interesting to, to build a team. Like I said, mm -hmm. you put on the paper what you want to have, and at the end of the process, you think that you have exactly what you wanted. But when you look at the paper that you first drew, it's fifty percent different. But still, the feeling is that you got what you wanted. So it's you know now the process already started, and we again we know what we need. We more or less know what we want. But it's too early to you know to, to talk with most of the guys because of our budget and you know it, mm -hmm. if you want to get great players you have to wait till July or August uh, and you know it's this is frustrating because again I want somebody and I have to wait 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 and you know it's it's difficult but yes we are talking already I guess for two months which direction to go who could replace who who is staying who is not staying. We always try to renegotiate the contracts with the players that are doing okay during the season and, and that did that in the past. So with our small budget, we have to keep working and not wait for the summer. Is it already like uh, clear or if not clear, then uh, uh, probable, uh, I mean, about the certain players uh, to stay, for example, Brandon Davis, is the, he the one who, would, who you would like to see next year or is it also Again, uh, we do the work inside. All right. We don't do the work outside, so we never yeah. mention the names, uh, you know, and, and we never talk, especially to the players that you have uh, during the season, to tell them that you know we don't mm -hmm. want you. I'm not talking about Brandon Davis, obviously, yes. but but if everybody's here, we have to trust them, and we always trust them till the end of the season. So we have a plan that maybe this player will leave, or maybe you know he's not having a great season, but if, if the finals come and he 
saves the finals. Obviously, he deserves a chance to stay. So mm-hmm. you never you never make uh, decisions, certain decisions, uh, until the season is over. You just have a it map, mapped out because you know you know that somebody's contract is running out. You offered an extension and he's not coming back, so you look for that position. But but if you have someone with a contract, you always think that he's staying and you give a chance to him until the very end of the season. Okay, last question. What would you think? Uh, would it be possible from Baltic states somebody else besides Conor Schalgren also someday join Euroleague? And is it uh, good or bad in meanings that uh, here there is not too many sponsors and stuff, and even not too many spectators? Maybe again, I don't think it would be a good idea. Uh, again, coming from me, maybe somebody can get insulted. But again, if you look at the numbers, like you said, that that we have. Sponsors-wise, arena-wise, uh, spectators-wise, uh, I'll I'll just take you the example of the of the juniors. So we have a junior team. Rivas has a junior team. Uh, Neptunas has a junior team. And when we play some regional competition, mm-hmm. both teams are okay, or all three teams are okay, but it's not the highest level. Mm-hmm. And if it would be only one team, if we could get all the guys together, I, I'm I'm pretty sure we could win against anybody in Europe because we have a good youth you know, system in, in, in the whole country. But now when we divide it, you know, it, it increases the prices of the players, it you know, mm-hmm. gets us apart and that would be exactly the same thing if we had, let's say, two teams in Euroleague. Mm-hmm. Then things would start, you know, there's certain market that you can have, especially local players, mm-hmm. so the prices go up just like in Russia where they need Russian players, you know, the, the prices go up. Mm-hmm. Not depending on the quality, and I guess game as a whole would suffer. So again, that's why I think it's one team is enough. We we happy to represent the Baltics. We would be happy to have Latvians and Estonians playing, and you know we treat them like our guys. And then you know this would be our goal uh, to have a Baltic uh, to be the Baltic representative in Euroleague, which I think would be a great honor, a great responsibility, but but something that we would like to have and. All of us competing against all those other guys who are big in budgets, big in people that they have, more selections in, in, in any field. So, do you know how many Estonians and Latvians are visiting Zalgiri uh, games percentually, or is it very minor? Or no, it's getting more and more. We we know that during the last year, it was for every game, it was about uh, five to four hundred people coming in for every game, and you know it's. Mm-hmm. Again, I know that now that Simas will be playing, many Estonians are coming and, and we are happy to, for that. And again, a lot of Estonians coming one way or another to watch the game. When we had Vetsvagas playing, uh, mm-hmm. you would see Latvians coming in yeah. as well to support other Latvians and other Euroleague teams. So after after last year, we after the Final Four, we, we really feel that the, the passion is there and the support from the Baltic countries is there, especially, you know, like I said, mm-hmm. like Estonia. Mostly maybe Estonia because I guess they love they, they love the basketball more than, than anything. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then we also have uh, the Venice stamp on, on, on our system because uh, Sim Sander and, and Trit, our coach, and, and even Kent who was with, mm-hmm. with us as well. So they really made a huge impact for us, and, and we still keep in contact. And, and I still believe that they're making an impact, helping the club. Representing us with, you know, Simas mm-hmm. being from our system and now playing Euroleague, uh, Trit teaching the, 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 the Tartu players and, and bringing the Fianians again. Mm-hmm. He's, he's kind of the link that we have and we are happy with that. And now maybe Ker might be someday reached to a level that he yes, might yes. be considerable. He, he really surprised everyone. In Borders. So again, his name is popping up a little bit. All the agents are taking notes. All the scouts are taking notes, and, and he's doing a really good job. You know, uh, being coming from Estonia, but being a team leader in our in our junior system, and you can feel that he has guys in control and people follow him, and, and, and he's helping us out a lot. As he today told, he already pays a lot of attention to learning Lithuanian. Yes, yes. so you know, again, like Simas, he speaks fluent, mm-hmm. so I guess... That yeah. is important. 
for us no but it's you know it's heartwarming because mm -hmm. uh, we we work with Estonians but all I know is that and that's it and yeah. it's it's when when Simas comes and starts speaking Lithuanian or you talk to Brit and he understands all Lithuanian it's 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 really heartwarming and it shows that they really you know they, mm -hmm. they, they love it here and, and that's why it's it's a great honor for us and, and we really love them back and the same with, with Kera I think it's only a matter of time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. For interview and for everything.